And I'll be I'll be talking to you guys today about um, how I've made a career in construction. And I'm here to answer any questions you might have on the journey along the way or what it means to be an engineer or what it means to be a woman who works in construction. So feel free to use that chat. Um, and I'm going to share with you a couple of videos that I and some of my colleagues have made along the way. So I'll get going. A little bit about me. I am from Baltimore, Maryland, and I lived there my whole life until I decided to go to uh, college in Chicago. I got an opportunity and they were looking for female engineers and I knew I always wanted to be a civil engineer. So I looked at this school and it was a really good fit. I ended up majoring in civil engineering with a focus on construction management. I also studied economics and double majored in that. And at that point, I started um, taking on internships and co-ops during college that helped me um, fine tune and figure out what I wanted to do and how I could use my degree and my learnings uh, to have a career that I thought was kind of fun. Uh, included a couple pictures today of some photos. I was working in uh, Los Angeles for the last five years until I moved to the Silicon Valley. So throughout this, you'll see some of the projects I worked on. And then before living in Los Angeles, I worked in New York City and Manhattan on construction for five years. So I can to share with you guys a bit today on some of the projects I've done. The four projects you'll see, these are called renderings of buildings uh, that I worked on. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about each of the projects. And I don't know how much you guys know about civil engineering, but to start out, I'm going to share a video about uh, the Ram Stadium project that is down in Los Angeles in Inglewood, California. I worked on that project for two years during the uh, planning, the design phase, and uh, the design of the whole structure, and I was a part of the foundations team. So I'm going to switch now and turn that video on. I think now it's no longer called the Ram Stadium, but it's called the Sophie Stadium because it's where the Rams and the Chargers play. This will be the greatest stadium built to date. The architecture, you look left, right, up, down. SoFi Stadium has everything. I've been fortunate to be out here the entire time of the construction of this project. I, mean, I can still remember when I flew out here fall of 2016, and it's been a real treat for all of us here on the team to be out here every day and see this thing evolve from its original site to the 100-foot deep hole to here today. We're getting an up-close look at SoFi Stadium as it enters the final stages of construction. The first part is really the design. You know, the design process usually is over a two-year period. I mean, we have drawings that we've issued for construction that if they were on the floor, they would come up to here. And they're complicated buildings, like 70,000 people in a three, four-hour window, all coming in at the same time. That doesn't really happen to that scale, to that degree, on any other building type. Since the Roman Colosseum, 2,000 years, people want to be in the building. They want to be part of the building, they want to experience the building, they want to watch the teams there. The architecture and the buildings have been not flatlined, but they've been sort of this common type uh, look and feel. And all the focus has been on the green grass and on the playing surface. So what we do is we do a very deep dive into the region. What does it mean to, to uh, be an Angelina? What kind of lifestyle, how that can all become embodied into an NFL venue. I think there's two big challenges right off the bat that, that we as a design team 
you know, gave a little pause to it. It was like, how are we going to uh, tackle these issues? The seismicity of the, of the job and the proximity to LAX. And those two kind of problems became the driving force in how the building ultimately looks the way it does. worked with HKS from the very early stages of design. Being here in LA and it's uh, obviously a very high seismic uh, zone. We've got a fault running right behind the stadium, but that also coupled with the site. You might see some airplanes behind me flying over the stadium. We're really close to LAX and we had to be below an elevation for the FAA to let these planes come by on the site. That meant we had to push the stadium about 100 feet into the ground, which is extremely unusual. To do that right next to a fault was a, a, a challenge on a, on a scale that uh, no one has ever tackled before. So the seismic demands are quite large. We had to plan for that from the start. We're designing for a major event either on the San Andreas Fault or Newport Inglewood Fault that runs right past the stadium. The roof structure sits on columns that, uh, that have isolators so that essentially the ground can move underneath the roof structure and not impart large accelerations. In a major seismic event, we expect that isolator to move about 50 inches. It's important to note that the, the roof structure and the seating bowl structure are completely independent. They don't touch. The Newport Inglewood Fault is just that way a little bit and it runs kind of north-south. So in the event of an earthquake, the motion is going to be stronger. Uh, if, the, if the earthquake happens on that fault, it's going to be stronger east-west. So this way right here, back and forth, this is going to be stronger than this way. And the isolators will tend to move a little bit more in that direction as there's more energy from the fault moving back and forth this way. I think what's amazing about the design team that we've brought, no one ever said, no, I don't think this is possible. Everyone kind of tackled, it's like, okay, this is a challenge. How are we going to do it? This is a unique architectural wonder of the world. And recently, the final piece of the canopy shell was lifted and set in place, forming the outline for the iconic roof that will be seen by tens of millions of people annually as they fly into LAX. SoFi Stadium is very unique with this roof canopy system that they have. It's not like your typical structure that's enclosed. The idea behind SoFi Stadium is for the comfort of the fans to be one click better than sitting in an outdoor stadium. So you're still getting all of the outdoor breeze from all four sides of the stadium, but you're shaded by the fritted pattern ETFE panels above you. A lot of people ask us, why do we have a roof in the stadium? Why are we covering it? And for us, it became a guarantee. You know, these buildings now aren't just for football, all right? They have to be entertainment destinations. And so the roof for us was a guarantee. It all starts out at a high level and then starts to just, you know, get deeper and deeper into the details. The metal panel on the, on the stadium is a fascinating uh, kind of exploration for us. And, and what we're seeing here is a series of mock-ups uh, that we utilize, testing different geometries of, of perforation, different sizes and scales of holes, and ultimately a, a full-scale size mock-up of what an actual panel would be at the stadium. And we did this to make sure that we were getting the correct amount of light, transparency, airflow. This stadium is gonna appear as a solid object from a distance. And we knew we wanted to change that perception as you get closer and closer to the building. So as you get from, say, the macro scale to air, until you transition to the site, you start to notice that, you know, can I see through this building? You know, can I, am I looking through the bowl the metal, which you, know, you can kind of see here, is actually the first time that it's been utilized. It's called white anodization. We worked with a group out of Kansas City Zaner Metals to create this, this, uh, this metal. It's a beautiful thing that looks almost white in direct sunlight, but transitions throughout the day. So sunsets, sunrises, it's gonna capture the, the pinks and the oranges, the hues of the beautiful sunsets here. So it's gonna change and evolve throughout the day. And then at night, it transitions and transforms. So that holes, which we're letting light into the building, actually kind of reverse at night, and they emit light. So we have a series of color-changing LEDs throughout the, 
the canopy of this building that really allow it to pulse with the energy of the events that are happening. In my career, I've been to several stadiums, worked on several stadiums, and the scale of SoFi Stadium really is, you know, beyond what I've seen before. How do we create the ultimate fan experience? I hope when people go to the stadium for the first time, yeah, they feel like the, this building couldn't happen anywhere else in the world. All right, so that was a little bit of an introduction to, uh, as a civil engineer, if you want to go into design and architecture, you get to be a part of kind of the planning and the, the thought that goes into the different structures and buildings and spaces that we all get to enjoy. So that's like one path that you can take. I have worked on a couple projects. This casino also in Los Angeles was a design build project where I got to work with architects and engineers as well as the construction workers. But the majority of my career has been spent uh, with the hard hats and the vest and putting construction in place, taking the designs of the architects and the engineers plans and building them. So right now the stadium in LA has about 3,000 workers every day. They work three shifts a day, 24 hours a day uh, to get the project set up for hopefully this upcoming season of football. And that's that one. Are there any questions? We can stop if you want to submit any or I'll, I can keep going. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them out loud. You can unmute yourself or you can also put them in the chat. Okay, so um, another project I'll talk to you about more on the construction side, which I tend to work with big concrete pours and cranes and uh, making sure that all the construction folks know where to go and what to be doing when they show up for work every day. Uh, Los Angeles had dozens and dozens of cranes in the sky over the last five years. I had the good fortune to work on a couple of the towers. Uh, one I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today is uh, Park, Park Fifth. It's a high rise apartment building uh, in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, talk to you a little bit about what it takes to go from nothing to uh, a full building. It involves, in this case, a lot of concrete. So we set up a tower crane and planned each concrete pour all the way up to the top. The foundation supports the building and prevents it from sinking. Uh, me and my colleagues, a couple engineers I worked with, had the opportunity to kind of share in what it took to plan that. So I'll play this for you. Oh. I'm Christina Ruiz, and I'm an assistant project manager uh, here on the Park Fifth job in downtown Los Angeles. Park Fifth is a high-rise residential. We've got 24 stories, 347 residential units. As the assistant project manager, I work through coordination with the design team, the owners, and also the trade partners, bringing this building from the foundation all the way up. One of my favorite parts about this job is the structural steel for the flying roof. It's two stories of structural steel, just kind of like a party hat on top of the building. I was given the opportunity to manage in the field all of these structural trades that I had worked in coordinating at, on the PM side. The technology came in really handy when we were working through the installation of the steel roof. Through the planning control process, we modeled every steel member that was going up on the roof. Taking that model and bringing it out into the field was the beneficial part. We've got a really great team out here. The way that we've been able to work together and communicate has definitely been a tribute to our success. Being able to see it from a concept to drawings and then to a real life structure, you kind of become really attached. And every day that I leave home and I walk through the park and I can look back and see 
all the advancements that we've done as a team to make this thing come together. I feel really proud knowing that you are directly impacting a part of your own community. All right, so that's a little bit uh, highlights of that project, and it was pretty exciting to be able to use a lot of technology. And just to be clear, to go into this type of work, um, it involves a lot of types of engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, designers. You don't even have to go into engineering, and you can be a part of this. So we used uh, some computer engineers to model everything that you See before you build it during the planning stages, you get to act it all out with kind of virtual Legos, which show you how um, something's going to look in 3D, and then this is a, a photo of what it actually looks like when we built it. We also did that with the apartment units, kind of to show you this is what we wanted to build, this is what the architects designed, and then this is the end result of what it actually looks like when you build it. So being able to change out and say, I don't want dark wood and change the colors, change different fixtures. So when you're going to build 350 of the exact same thing, it's important that you understand and you accept and know that everyone's going to be happy with what it looks like. So in the video, you saw them talking about some of the mock-ups they did for the roof ceilings. We did an entire mock-up of an apartment to make sure the client was going to be satisfied um, with that. Um, before I leave this project, I wanted to share a video. Christina, who was in the last video, she and I, as they were erecting the tower crane after it went up, we actually had the opportunity to go to climb to the top. It's the tallest freestanding crane that they make in the whole world. So that means that it's assembled and erected all in one, on one go and doesn't get any taller. And then you take it down. Um, all in one go. So I'll share a video she put together when we walk to the top. You got V12, I got 12 V. Got bottles, got weed, got my, my. I'm all the way up. Shorty, what you want? I got what you need. Me. Shorty, what you want? I got what you need. Huh? Shorty, what you want? I got what you need. I'm all the way up. Huh? So that kind of highlights some of the more fun days at the office when you get to climb to the top of Los Angeles and look out over the mountains. It's pretty fun. So you might be asking, how can I get involved? And I think you guys already seem to be taking the right steps forward, being a part of this program this summer. There's a lot of other ways that you can find out how to get more involved and exercise these types of um, programs to learn more about engineering or construction as you go into high school and then into college. Uh, some of the groups you see on the screen are some great ways and resources me and my peers have used to get some good opportunities, whether it was summer internships or just meeting people that work in the industry. Uh, highly um, suggest reaching out, being a part of some of the builds and different tech programs that you guys already seem to be a part of. Um, but yeah, wanted to open it up. Hopefully you guys have some questions, um, maybe about some of the projects I talked about or the details or um, about tower cranes, or if you want to know, I can share with you a little bit about the project I'm working on right now in Silicon Valley. All right, teachers, I feel like you might know your students best and know how to get them to participate after these first few days already of class, but um, some questions, some comments, anything would be appreciated from all of our, any of our 40 plus guests. Yeah, more than kiddos, I'm sure you have some questions or comments, asking a little bit more information. About um, what a type of project that you like to work on the 
the most, whether it's like a larger building or apartments or anything like that? Okay. Um, I, in the past, I've been working, when I was in New York City, I worked on hospitals and that was really exciting just because you get to see how detailed and how much thought goes into the process of designing uh, an operation lab or a cancer research lab where they make medicine or vaccines. Uh, that was really fun getting to work with doctors and nurses as um, we made sure it was effective and efficient for the different ways that these spaces would be used in the future. I'll show you guys a little bit about the project I'm working on right now. Maybe it's it's in your area. You might have more questions. Is everyone familiar with Levi Stadium where the 49ers play? Okay. So this is Levi Stadium, and that's right out behind me. So right now I'm sitting in my office right outside Levi Stadium. And everything on the screen that you see doesn't exist yet. And right now on this project, we are, I now work for a real estate developer, so I'm not in construction management directly, but working for a real estate developer, I'm in this building right here, and we are working to build each one of these buildings piece by piece. So it's going to take probably 12 to 15 years to build everything you see here, and every day I come in and we focus on each aspect of that. So this is going to be a hotel and this is going to be a movie theater and all of this one day when you go to the 49ers games will be right out front and part of the experience. So to show it in plan view, you can see here's the stadium and these are the different things uh, residential will be building, hotels, places to eat, shopping malls. And then we work on these different renderings with the designers and architects to kind of communicate to our communities what these spaces will look like when we finish. So I'm excited to work on that. If you look during the Rams video, you saw it was just a big dirt field. And then after four years of construction, you have a whole stadium. So that's what this looks like now. It's just one big dirt field. And then in five years, you'll be able to walk around these spaces, go to these restaurants, go to uh, the movie theater and have a really great time, hopefully. And that's kind of what's exciting about our job is to be able to take a field and turn it into something. Come on, any question? I was going to say, actually, this might help, is uh, my students and all, all of our Moreland students, if you guys could um, each ask a question, just think of a question. I think they might need like some think time, you know, to write a good question. So if you guys okay. could take maybe like a minute and then write a question. And if you feel like too shy to type it to everyone, you could type it to me if that makes you feel better. And then we could at least try to get some more questions out there. Well, everyone's thinking, it looks like we had a hand raised. Is it Renee? How do you say your first name, buddy? Yeah, raising your hand. Hi, Renee. Do you have a question? Yeah. What, go for it, bud. Hi. Um, yeah. Uh oh. How long did it take to build a stadium? How long did it take to build a stadium? I think that's what he asked. So the stadium was originally from the time it was thought about. We spent two years getting it ready just in design and what was shared with Mark and the others on uh, the architects and the structural engineers and figuring out how to be able to handle and make it earthquake proof and be in the flight path to LAX. So it was two years dedicated to just planning. And then as we started building, we kept designing. So for two years of design, but the design continued into construction, 
We're, they're now into the fourth year of construction. So I'd say about six years so far, and it's been in construction four. And like I said, it's, it's very uh, tedious work, and there's 3,000 people working there every day to get it built. Okay. So someone sent me a question. Thanks privately. for your question. Someone oh, go for it. Yeah. Why, they said, why did you choose to be an engineer? I chose to be an engineer because I love buildings, uh, plain and simple. Uh, whenever I would go into the city growing up and walk around the streets and be able to look up at these towers, it was always exciting. And I love bridges and tunnels and just been fascinated about how man is able to build uh, such unique spaces um, here. And I've just always been really excited and passionate about um, Legos and connects and all the stuff about design and building. So it was pretty, it was a really easy choice because it was always a passion of mine. How long does it take to become an engineer designer? I, I went to, undergraduate college for four years and I got a under a bachelor's of science in civil engineering and then I was able to get um, a job right out of college so didn't need um, any further education I while I was working in New York I did go for a graduate degree so I went to night school as well just for my own benefit but you um, are able to do everything I've shared today with a four years bachelor's degree. Has anyone ever gotten like seriously hurt while building? Um, I would have to say yes. I have not experienced um, any tragic injuries, but a big part of my job uh, as far as going over how that tower crane went up was I spent six months reviewing safety plans and coordinating with different um, crane operators, the fire department, the police station in LA to make sure that it was going to be 100% safe for everyone on site, for myself, for my peers, and for everyone in the city. So the amount of time to put up a crane takes three days, but it took six months to plan it to make sure it went safely. So it's really a big part of my day-to-day -day is safety. We preach it, we learn it, we go to classes about it, and we want to make sure that everyone that shows up for work leaves in the exact same condition every day. So yes, it's a dangerous, a more high-risk industry, but we do take safety as a top priority. Yeah, I think tips that works with you? I don't. Um, I was probably the only one in my family that had this strong passion uh, for engineering and construction. So I don't have any relatives, but since I started college, I have made a really close group of friends like I, um, through the Society of Women Engineers and a bunch of other groups. I have made a second family in this world of I have friends all over the world building different things and working on bridges and working on massive buildings in New York City and Washington, D.C. and Chicago. And I have built a second family through all this of people who we, we travel for the project because it's so exciting. And we my family's still back east, but they know how much I love construction and changing communities for the better. So they support this uh, vagabond world, as I call it. All right, it looks like we have a few more questions in the chat. Oh, sorry, was a student asking one there? No? All right. So one question is, can one minor mistake mess up the entire building when it's undergoing construction? Um, it can feel like that sometimes, but I, I like to say that every day I'm here because a mistake's going to be made. And my job is that if 10 things were going to go wrong, 
I uh, tried to mitigate it so that all nine of them go really smoothly with all the planning, but we just know that one thing is going to go wrong, and the great thing about engineering is we fix it. So you can add more rebar to something, you can, uh, you can put more glass in, you can put more steel in, you can demo it, you can rebuild it. So a lot of the days checks and balances and we run a lot of tests and a lot of reports so that we verify everything is put in place as designed and it's inspected and certified. And if it's not, we fix it. So we're here every day with hundreds of people inspecting and checking to make sure that what the intended design is actually built. And if it's not and a mistake is made, not a problem, and we figure out a way to fix it. Okay, let's see. Another question we have here. How do you come up with the idea of building something? How do you get ideas when working on these projects, as in the idea of how to, uh, how to structure these buildings? So from a technical standpoint, you it's all really what the client would want. So the person that is funding the project, who's paying for it, uh, a lot of that is part of the system and just figuring out uh, what they think is going to be the most aesthetically pleasing. So if you're building a school, uh, you want to focus on different spaces and collaborative work environments and make it fun. Make sure you want to be in the cafeteria. Make sure there's a place that it's functional. There's lockers and there's a gym and all of that makes sense so that you're not walking around from one end to another and that it looks good. So a lot of that comes from functionality and design, but then when I get involved, I want to make sure that uh, it's feasible, that it can be within budget, that it can be um, done in the amount of time so that it's ready for when the students need to come into school. So if there's some ideas that we have to make it go faster or be tall, um, be more cost effective so that you could add a better, you know, something on the play around that you didn't have money for in the budget, but you can add it because we save money. We come to the table with stuff like that. So everything's a balance and it's compromised between what everybody wants and what everybody needs and, and the resources available. I don't know if that was a good answer or not, but. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. Um, here's another question. Hopefully the spaces we build are fun and people want to go to them and that they're safe. And if you're building a hospital, it's there to serve the purpose and keep patients alive and healthy, but also mentally have them have an experience that doesn't add any more stress onto their day. Um, someone asked here, what local colleges have engineering programs? Okay, well, the teachers, on, I'm new to the area. I've been here about six months, but I hear that uh, San Jose is a great school for engineering. Um, and I know that a lot of my peers um, here went to Berkeley or SLO, uh, San Luis Obispo. Do you guys know some others? <laughs> I know those ones I've heard of. That, that was about my uh, the extent of my knowledge there as well. Um, I think that's yeah, all. Yeah, Christina, the girl in the video, went to slow. Um, and she's a big fan, so I know about that one. <laughs> Mustangs. Okay, here's another one. Um, when coming up with ideas for building, did new and maybe better ideas come up when already confirming an idea before? Yes, so construction is really different. I'd say in a lot of other engineering, you typically work on a project for six weeks to a year. Uh, if you're a programmer or a software developer, the when you think about how quickly the internet has changed things and how fast technology changes or how one week people like Snapchat or the next month you like TikTok, you have to be really quick to change and adapt to uh, the needs of 
your community. But if you look back at construction, I know we referenced in this video the Colosseum. There's not, it, that was 2,000 years ago, and the difference between the Colosseum and Levi Stadium or Ram Stadium are not that significant. So when you're planning for the project you see on the screen and it takes 12 to 15 years to build all that, it's kind of crazy to think that if you look at New York City or San Francisco, those cities or even your homes or your schools haven't changed much in the last 100 years, but we do have to adapt a lot to uh, green building and energy and adding solar panels or making sure we have 5G internet capabilities and that tech software companies are going to want to move into this building and it's going to be safe and secure for their servers and even if you guys don't go into engineering or civil engineering, you might be working for Apple in this building in 10 years and we have to plan for that. So as technology changes outside of construction or within construction over a 10 year project, you have to adapt. So yes, everything is constantly evolving and my role here is to be aware of the future and the needs. So like right now my company is exploring what do workspaces look like um, post COVID, which has been kind of exciting. And you'll hear about in the next few years how spaces have better air exchanges and we are concerned about how to make sure viruses don't spread quickly. So different things that we're studying right now will be inside these buildings to make them safer, safer and more usable for your generation in a workspace. So yeah, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much that touches all of this, whether it's math or science or technology or engineering. Uh, there's so much you can do and there's so much I'm learning every day about uh, the spaces we live in and where the water goes and how to handle storm water, how to bring power and electricity to this much space when there was nothing. So each day brings new challenges and new learning opportunities, which is why I love my job so much. It never gets boring, and sometimes we get to climb to the top of cranes. That's very cool. Um, okay, let's. It's about 11:42 right now. Um, this is kind of a two-parter, and maybe this will be our last question for the day, unless there's any very time-sensitive questions you all you students want answered. But what makes a building earthquake safe? And then kind of unrelated, but also what makes a building energy efficient? So earthquake safe is called your seismic design, which is done by a structural engineer. The two gentlemen on the film talked about that. So it's about knowing where your faults are, where you're susceptible and where an earthquake um, might occur. And based on the local area and the local ground and your geotech information, you'll know how things will move and you can design the structure to move with it. So depending on how you, how you know and study and run reports and uh, computer simulations of how the ground in that area is going to move given a big earthquake, you then design your structure to move with it. So when you're in a high rise, you can feel, if you go to the top floor of a skyscraper, it's moving like this. And you can feel the structure doing that. And it can be kind of scary, but structurally it's designed to do that. And in an earthquake, it's designed to bend and ebb even more so in the direction that it's anticipated to move. So that's that one. It seems really scary, but the fact that they're, everyone's thinking about it and studying it and running analysis on it for years makes you feel a bit safer. And what was the next one about energy? Uh, what makes, yeah, what makes a building energy efficient? Um, well, right on the screen, you can see there's, a, there's an entity called LEED. So LEED is a, a metric system that determines all aspects about sustainability when it comes to buildings and spaces we live. So, one big thing that has has affected uh, and made our buildings a lot more energy efficient is what materials you use to build them out of and how they absorb or don't absorb light and heat. 
So the windows and the glass, you'll see all these are white um, roofs with so because white doesn't absorb the sun. Whereas like in the past, it would be like a black tar roof can make a building really hot. And then you have to use more energy to cool it off. So the building materials we use, the fact that um, the way that we use light and shade to keep that down. Uh, other ways of making it more energy efficient is if there's some green roofs here, if it rains, you want to absorb that water and then you can uh, process the rainwater and put it back into the toilets or into um, landscape irrigation so that you're not using new water for those systems. So there's, there's hundreds of different ways to keep energy in these buildings um, lower. And that's what we study for years before we build them. All right. Um, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, is there any last questions at all from anyone else? If not, um, again, Stephanie, thank you so much from us here at SVF, from um, uh, the two classes here that joined us as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stick around just for the next minute or two. Um, as people are leaving, if you have a question you'd like to leave with Stephanie, please feel free. Um, if not, like I said, I'll keep this open for the next few minutes just while you make your way back to your regular class. And Wendy and Shane, if you have any um, directions or if you want to include <clears throat> the meeting link in the chat, however best you want to do it. Uh, my well, students thanks. go back to you, Google Stephanie. Classroom and to the uh, regular link, and then we'll talk when everybody has.